Morning, church. Lovely to be here. Thanks, Sam. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Helen Trelfo. Ended up with a bit of a challenging surname, though, marrying this great guy down here, but that's okay. Glenn and I, when we were first married, we um, lived at Rochdale here, and our, our first church together was Springwood Church. In fact, I got baptised there. On October the 7th, it was such hot weather that entire week, roasting. I couldn't believe it. I kept thinking, wow, what is the summer going to be like ahead of us? And the people who prepared the font over there must have thought, well, you know, in response to the hot weather, we'll just make it cold. And you know how you hop in and the pastor is sharing some of your journey with the church. And I hopped in, and I am not the girl with, you know, 400 onlookers <laughs> to life's big events. And I'm standing there with the pastor, and I got colder and colder and colder and started shaking and shivering. And I kept looking at Glenn holding our little boy, Tom, and I remember thinking things like, while I was actively listening to Peter Cousins telling the church about my decision to follow Jesus, I remember thinking things like, boy, I hope when I go back, my feet don't slip out and I do this great splash backwards. I hope I don't feel really weird when he puts the hanky over my face and all of those things. And that's just keeping it real this morning. That was my journey. But you know, if I could have a conversation with my 24-year-old self, what I would say as I looked me in the eyes is this. Helen, do you know that your Saviour loves you so much? There is not a single thing you'll ever be able to do in your entire life that will make him love you less. And there's not one single good act that you can do that will make him love you more. That's what I would have said to myself that day. And it's with that thought in mind that we're going to have a look at our opening video and then I'm going to go into our, mes in, into our uh, message today. So Joe, we'll just show that, thanks. In the country of China, the situation of the lepers has become a great tragedy. There are 600 colonies and more than 250,000 lepers. The first time I saw the lepers and I looked upon their faces, I felt a great pain inside my heart. But I felt called to serve them because they are the sons and daughters of God. These people were abandoned by society and they feel that they don't belong. Our goal is to help them feel special, that they are loved, but we also want them to know that Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for them, that they are redeemed and there is a kingdom for them.
I went to China in 2006 and saw the situation with the lepers and found out that not one Adventist was working to help them. I wanted to do something to help. We are involved with 18 projects and we have more than 70 volunteers. We live among the people in the colony, we eat with them, we serve them. Jesus Christ served the people. He provided for their needs. That is what we are trying to do here. We want to help these people and to provide for their needs, just like Jesus did. So far, 327 lepers have been baptized. My goal is to train these new converts to serve and help other lepers. The first time we touch the wounds of the lepers, it helps them to feel that someone cares about them. Through this, we are showing the love of Jesus to them. We are earning their trust. We typically call that a mission story, don't we? But this morning, I believe it needs to be renamed because I call it a love story. And that's your church and it's my church that are out there serving those people with so much love and compassion, sharing the gospel. It's the story of a loving God who left heaven and came to earth to live in our neighbourhood, to walk with us, to feel our pain, to share our joy, to call us to come home. And that story hasn't grown old or become irrelevant. It is the mainstay of the church that Jesus Christ is our friend, that he is the only answer to this world's problems and he is the only one that can bring peace into our hearts there are two things central this morning that we're going to put on the table. What has God done for us? And what does God want us to do for others? What has God done for us? What I've found in my life is that sin breaks us. It breaks our hearts. It breaks our families. It breaks our relationships with each other. And ultimately, it breaks our relationship with God. And we can't do anything about this problem because we're not truly good. The Bible tells us that all have fallen short of the glory of God. And there is only one who is truly good. And before this earth was ever created, the Father came together with his son, Jesus Christ, and they already had the rescue plan in place. If you want an example of a loving, healthy father, look at that alone. Before we even started hurting ourselves or hurting each other, they had a plan in place. And the father said, I'm willing to give my all. And the son said, I'm willing to pay it all. 
And sometimes we forget as we struggle on this earth together that we have an enemy. His name is Satan. And the Bible calls him the enemy of our souls. Jesus Christ, who knew him so well, says that he was a liar, a thief and a murderer from the beginning. And he came to earth to wreak havoc upon God's gift to to mankind. And he started with the family of Adam and Eve. Every evil thought, every hard-hearted attitude that they had towards each other and towards their God, he encouraged. And church, let me tell you, he's on to a winning game plan and he hasn't changed that. When you're struggling with each other, so often we're so involved looking at what the other person has done to us and knowing what we've done to them that we forget that there is a master planner in place stirring us up. And when we were at our weakest, God sent his son to rescue humanity. I love how the Message Bible says, then John chapter 1, that Jesus moved into our neighbourhood and a light was lit for all humanity. This morning we're going to be opening up our Bibles. John chapter 3, verse 16 to 18. John chapter 3, verse 16 to 18. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger at the world to tell it how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in a -a one-of-a-kind son of God when introduced to him. We have always had a God who has been for us, not against us. And when Jesus came to this earth, it was game on with Satan. And what wins out today is what won out then. Greater than the whole of our sum total of failures was the love of God. Let's have a look at this in my favourite book of the Bible, Romans. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to 8. Romans chapter 5, and we're starting at verse 6. We're staying in the book of Romans after this. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time to die for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. The Message Bible says that while we were of no use whatsoever to God, he sent his son to die for us. Turning over a couple of chapters to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and we're going to be starting in verse 32 there. Romans chapter 8, since he did not spare even his own son for us, but gave him up for us all, won't he surely also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us when God has chosen us for his own? Will God? No, he is the one who has forgiven us and given us right standing with himself. 
Who then will condemn us? Will Christ? No, for he is the one who died for us and came back to life again for us and is sitting at the place of highest honour next to God, pleading for us there in heaven. Who then can ever keep the love of Christ from us? When we have trouble or calamity, when we are hunted down or destroyed, is it because he doesn't love us anymore? And if we're hungry or penniless or in danger or threatened with death, has God deserted us? No, for the scriptures tell us that for his sake we must be ready to face death at every moment of the day. We are like sheep awaiting slaughter, but despite all this overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us enough to die for us. For I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't, life can't. The angels won't and all the powers of hell itself cannot keep God's love away. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, or where we are high above the sky or in deepest ocean, nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God demonstrated by our Lord Jesus Christ when he died for us. I love the way that passage of scripture ends. He's saying to us, Paul's saying to us, if you want to know for certain that what I am telling you is true, look at the cross. There is love on display. Friends, I know that I am a sinner saved by grace. And what that simply means is that I am saved to live forever by the undeserved kindness of a merciful God. And some of you may struggle with this concept for about, I'm not sure, it was an extended period in my life, I'm going to say at least 10 years, I did what maybe some of you do, came to church every week, heard what the Bible said, I believed what I heard, that wasn't the issue. I agreed with it in my head. But in my heart, there was an ongoing journey like this. Do any of you know what I mean? If I was doing well, if I was being kind to people, if I was patient, if I was reading my Bible, if I had all my relationship ducks in a line, then I felt, you know, I'm good with God. But on the days that those things weren't working, I felt so far from God. And there were many nights I woke up where I thought to myself, you know I'm going to spend my entire life all around this religious activity and at the end it's all going to be for nothing. And I said to a friend of mine who just knew the love of God, how do you know that? Because she had been severely abused sexually, physically, emotionally by her father Every day. No break. You get your head around that for a moment. How that messes with you. And yet she was sure that God was good and that he loved her. And she said to me, Helen, repetition does its work. One way or the other, repetition will do its work. And so she said, I simply started telling myself, God loves me. He loves me all the time. There's never a moment when God doesn't love me. And she said, and to be honest, I've probably told myself over a million times about the love of God for me. And she said, now I feel it all the time. I think it all the time. There's never a moment when I doubt. So I just thought, well, I'm going to do this. Hundreds of times, thousands of times, even up to today, I declare when I wake up through the night, God loves me. He loves me all the time. He can't do without me because his love for me is so great for me. 
And finally, repetition has done its work. And I'm at peace because I know, I know I'm forgiven and I'm loved. God's sacrifice was enough for my sin and for your sin. And I love in Romans chapter 5, verse 18 to 20, we won't go there, but I'll tell you what it says. It says, this first man, Adam, gave us an example of disobedience. And then there was a second man, and his name was Jesus Christ. And his one act of faithfulness was enough to make everyone right. And how that verse ends is, where sin abounds, grace abounds so much more. You cannot out the grace of God. And so that's what God has done for us. But the other question on the table this morning is, what does God want us to do for others? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 to 20. Matthew 28, verse 16 to 20. Then the eleven followers went to Galilee. They went to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some did not believe. That's a snapshot of church. They did what they were told to do. They worshipped him, but amongst the group were some believers and some still on the way. Verse 18, then Jesus came and said to them, all power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go and make followers of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to do all the things that I have told you and I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Incredible promise there. So often we feel that we're doing this in our own strength and we're on our own. Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you. You know, interestingly, when you read the Gospels, one of the habits of Jesus that came out was was that he was in the synagogue on Sabbath. In fact, the Bible clearly says that was his custom. And that's a good place to find yourself on Sabbath, is in church. But the rest of the week, which is the bulk of the Gospels, we see Jesus in the community. He's out at the marketplace. He's walking down dusty streets. He's sitting down and reclining and eating a meal with friends. He's near the sea. He's in boats. He's on mountains. He's in the desert. And what I see is that my saviour, Jesus had time for people wherever he was. He listened to what they needed and it wasn't always what they asked for. He was not ashamed or embarrassed to be seen with anyone. In fact, when he was at a party thrown by Matthew, this new believer, and he's at ease with all of Matthew's friends. The church, do you hear me? The church leaders came round to have it out with his disciples and to criticise Jesus. And Jesus took them on and he said, it is not the well I've come to, to heal, but it is the sick who need a doctor. I didn't come to call the righteous I came to call sinners. And we see how Jesus reached out to a woman at the well. The Pharisees, the tax collectors, the paralytic and adulterous woman. I could talk to you this morning about how Jesus reached out to the parents of a dead girl. How he stopped a funeral and spoke to the widowed mother of a dead son. I could tell you how he was the only one not afraid of two 
demon-possessed men. On and on, the Gospels show us how he reached people where they were. And Jesus set up a pattern. And in, as the New Testament unfolds, we see Peter and Paul and Luke and Silas and Barnabas travelling to all the known world, living with people, like in our opening video, working with people, eating with people, living with people. And for those of you who have been on mission trips, you know that's the quickest way to get to the heart issues of community. The church was built upon this truth and I'm challenged, I'm deeply challenged because increasingly you know what I'm saying is true. We are living frenetic, busy lives filled with very little worth. Am I right? I am. This week, I heard government leaders and medical professionals saying despite the millions spent on youth suicide, the rate continues to go up and up and up. And I would say, as a believer in Jesus Christ, that one of the core things missing is a place of value with our God. This world needs us. And I am often pulling into my driveway and I know how many steps it is to my front door where I can unlock it, I can walk in, and I can be in my own little world instead of spending time looking around, see if one of my neighbours are home, maybe just popping in for a moment to say hi. One of the things that Glenn and I have found um, a couple of years ago that worked really well in our household was that we got to know our neighbours on purpose. They didn't know that after they introduced themselves to the, me, I had notes on my phone and I would put their name in. Who lived with them? Did they have a dog? Did they have a cat? Just so I had some conversation to talk to them about, I found out from one of the mums who lived across the road from me that there's an informal gathering of young families at four o'clock every afternoon up at the park. And I don't have little people in my household, but I have a little dog that likes little children. So up we go. And it is a wonderful thing for them to know us and for us to know them. Don't be afraid to ask your neighbours for help. We've done that, cutting down large trees and just needing some help with moving furniture. They found out, because Glenn's outside a lot, that he has an interest in car and cars and before he started his photography career, he was a mechanic. So if they're... God challenge in that area. They'll stroll over and have a chat to him. But the thing is this. We expect people to somehow magically make their way to church to encounter Jesus. And Jesus has already shown us how to do it. And I'm asking you today to examine your lives and to ask, what community group can you join? something completely disconnected from church. And you're saying to me, Helen, I can't even keep up with church. The church calendars are so busy. And the church friends are so precious, aren't they? And we love to be together. But this world needs us. And my suggestion to you this morning is find something you love that you have fun with because a happy person is a good advertisement for Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter whether it's gardening or photography or getting fit or a walking club or a mum's group. It doesn't matter really what it is. What it matters is that you're having a good time so that you naturally share your hope in Jesus. I don't know how it goes in your house, but when I get up in the night time, I tend to not put on a torch. I've been like that since I was a child. 
I have somebody in my life, very dear to me, who always uses the torch. But I just tend to walk around the house in the dark and I think that part of the reason is that is that we've already been in the dark and all of us get comfortable with the dark. Isn't that true? But what happens is that when we move into the community and we take the light of the gospel in living inside of us naturally is that we get to make new friends. And as we do, they get to light. To have a light in their life from us. And as that light of Jesus' love burns in their life, they get to meet other people and they get to have the light of God's love. Do you see how easy it is? That's God's plan for sharing the gospel and this is what he wants us to do for each other. Thanks, girls. I want to show you a photo of, some photos of a gorgeous friend. I only met Caitlin four months ago and Caitlin told me this about herself within the first five minutes of me meeting her. She said, Helen, when I was 17, somebody invited my parents to go to church. We weren't a church-going family. But my parents, they said yes. And they said to me, do you want to come? And she said, I said, no, I don't think that I'm that interested. But when church time rolled around, she was at home and she thought, you know, why not? I'm just going to go. She said that night when they went to church, somebody asked the question, this is who Jesus Christ is and this is how much he loves you. Do you want to follow him? Do you want him to be your Lord and Saviour? She said that night, mum and dad and I gave our life to Jesus Christ. And she said, and I came home and as I flopped back on my bed, she said, I thought to myself, I can't believe I've spent 17 years of my life walking this earth and never knowing that Jesus loves me. Shortly after that, she heard about the ministry in Uganda called Hope for Women for Africa. And she thought, you know, what can I do to support that? She said, I never intended to go to Uganda. She said, I thought, I'll just get around this and I'll start, you know, finding some things and finding some ways to support it. She said, within 12 months, I was over there working with the single teen mums who have nothing. This ministry reaches in and supports the whole family. It provides for the prenatal care of the pregnant girl. It, it pays for her to be able to go to hospital and give birth to her baby. Then it provides follow-up care. While she's carrying her child, already training begins for how she can earn a living when she is a mother to support this child. An incredible work. Caitlin said, you know, I just go around the village of an afternoon and I share the love of Jesus. I do Bible studies and just encourage the girls. And I love that word encourage. It means to add courage to someone's life. And what Caitlin is doing is that she is literally living Romans 12 verse 2. December 15th this year sees her leave America again to travel takes her nearly two days. She has to go to New York, to Amsterdam, to Rwanda, and then to Uganda. This is what she's living, and this is what the Lord wants us to live. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, going to work and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit in without even thinking. 
Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognise what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best in you. He develops well-formed maturity in you. God has a dream for this church. For his church. It's a whole lot bigger than the Adventist denomination. He's longing for us to come home. Beautiful quote from a Christian author, Ellen White. She says about that time when there's this incredible reunion in heaven. What sustained the Son of God during his life of toil and sacrifice He saw the results of the travail of his soul and he was satisfied. Looking into eternity, he beheld the happiness of those who through his humiliation had received pardon and everlasting life. His ear is caught with the songs of the redeemed. He heard the ransomed ones singing the songs of Moses and the Lamb. Honour and glory and power unto him who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. There the redeemed greet those who led them to the Saviour and all unite in praising the one who died that human beings might have life forever with God. The conflict is over. Tribulation and strife are at an end. Songs of victory fill all of heaven as the ransomed ones take up their joyful songs. Worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain and lives again, a triumphant conqueror. What an incredible scene. What a place. Just had a beautiful music video to give us some insight into how much the Father loves us. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That he should give his only son To make a wretch his treasure How great the pain of searing loss The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory.
Eldest son Tom lives in Japan, and for any of you that know anything at all about Glenn and I, you'll know this truth about our lives. We are crazy in love with our two sons. In fact, that love just seems to grow the more they do. And with one child permanently living overseas, one of the ways that we deal with that is about every 18 months the original four Trelfos get together for a week or more. We often go somewhere, we plan it, we save for it. We go somewhere because these boys like being outside with their dad. And last Christmas, they said, Mum, we want to go scuba diving. Snorkeling. <laughs> Snorkeling. And so Glenn and I did some homework and we found Ellie Beach... Uh, you know, was recommended to us. And so Tom flew in from Japan and I had booked flights up to Proserpine. When I told Glenn the times, he said to me, honey, that's too close. Don't you love when your husband's right? The plane was held up a bit on the journey over and Tom kept messaging me and he said, mum, I'm not going to make it. And I said to him, you know, honey, this will all work out. Try not to worry about it. His plane landed. He got off. He got through customs. He caught the bus over. And where the three of us are all at the gate waiting, looking down the hall eagerly. And as he's running along with his bag, he's looking for us. And Glenn spotted him first. And with a whoop, he was off. And these two men met, running. And they did that wonderful man hug. You know that men do? We, we hug differently, ladies. But they did that wonderful man hug. And I saw something that Glenn couldn't see. Our 28-year-old son was crying on his father's shoulder. Today, I'm asking you to consider this. You have a father in heaven who's eagerly scanning the horizon of life and he's looking for his sons and his daughters to arrive home. And you might be already on your way. If you are, keep going. But some of you haven't even started the journey. And some of you have started the journey and you've lost your way. Maybe nobody knows, but you know it. This morning I want us to close this service with standing together before the throne of God for prayer. We're going to be closing our eyes. This is a holy time when we're before our Lord and Saviour. This morning, for those of you who are like Caitlin, who have heard the invitation... to come home. This morning, I want you to raise your hands where you are. Eyes closed, please, everybody. And for those of you who have wandered off and you know it, 
and you're saying, today I've heard the invitation to come home. I want you to raise your hand where you are. I'm giving an invitation on behalf of Jesus Christ to come on home. Thank you so much for those who have heard the call this morning. Let's pray together, church family. Jesus Christ, thank you so much that your power of your spirit has been here present with us. Today, Lord, we have heard from heaven the value of your love for us. The Holy Spirit has stirred up inside of us those ashes and blown on them and a fire has started in our heart that's warming us through. Lord, there are others that need the light of your love and peace and we know them or we're going to meet them. So I'm asking this morning as we turn our face towards home and we give you the greatest gift that we can, our love and appreciation for sending Jesus, that we'll have our hands out and we'll be inviting others to walk along with us. I can't do this journey on my own, Jesus, and neither can anyone else in this church and there is not a person in the community who can make it on their own. We all have to show each other how good our God is. So I'm asking today, go with us, Lord, when we leave this building. Let it not be another Sabbath. But mark it on our hearts somehow, I ask, through the wonderful, glorious name of Jesus Christ who lives forever and ever. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen and Amen.